I'm on the microphone that Linda will be using today. Can you hear me? Perfect. Good. Now, it may be that I'm going to have to do an ad lib. And maybe that I'm going to have to do an ad lib off the top. I would say with four wins, he's doing six days. Good morning, live from Czech TV in Victoria. And my guests this morning will be the leader of the opposition, Davy Barrett, the NDP, of course, and later in the program, the Minister of Human Resources, the Honorable Andres McCarthy. But first off the top this morning, I want to give you a little picture of what happened in the legislature. My, I wish we had live television coverage of the debates in the legislature. But I'm going to give you my picture of what happened in the legislature, first off the top, after this break. It's not often I get the chance to act as a real live, old-fashioned reporter with pencil and paper in the legislature at Victoria. And you've seen a number of observations that the NDP have muffed the question period, that the debate, the standard of debate in the House of Victoria, which runs the big business affairs of this government, is not good. I think to some extent, after a couple of days of watching in the House and listening in the gallery, I can confirm that. Matter of fact, I had two of the worst speeches I've ever heard on the floor of the House yesterday afternoon. One was from Premier Bennett, and the other was from Don Phillips. And the Phillips speech yesterday, relevant to nothing, reminded me of an evangelist on a station in the southern United States on a wet Sunday morning. Not that the NDP is clean by any manner of means. I think that some of their questioners become so convoluted and overcome by the importance and the double talk of parliamentary affairs that they can't ask a simple question. Mind you, even if the question gets through to a cabinet minister, such as McGeer on his feet yesterday on questions about the BC telephone rates, his answers are so convoluted and complex that nobody can understand them. Just on the subject of BC telephone rates, what the opposition was trying to do yesterday was find out if the BC government was going to fight the latest increase proposed in telephone rates uh, if, if the government was going to do this. McGeer's answer was along the effect that we've opposed them now and again, by and large, over a number of years. But after all, the CRTC, which handles telephone rates, is a federal body. And what's the point of going to a federal body? Because they're going to do what Ottawa tells them, and therefore we can only deal with Ottawa and not with the CRTC about telephone communication rates. Made no sense. Gobbledygook. There was one thing that made sense yesterday, and I welcomed it, because it would look as if some of the non-lawyers in the NDP might take the ball away from the legal profession and ask some pointed and searching questions about the state of justice in British Columbia. You may well know that I've had a lot of what I believe to be reasonable concerns. This, of course, and every lawyer watching will grimace when I say this, harks back to the Farris resignation as Chief Justice of the, Supreme of the Court of Appeal of British Columbia. And Levy, Norman Levy got up in the house yesterday, and here's what he said, if I can find my glasses. Oh, here they are. It wasn't Ali McDonald. It wasn't Gary Locke. It wasn't Stu Leggett. It was a layman. As a matter of fact, at one time, Levy said, to be quite accurate, it's time justice was questioned by people other than lawyers. And he said, at the time of the... 
what happened was that Bennett was up on his estimates. Now, each minister is questioned on his estimates. And as you know, Mr. Bennett's estimates have gone from $221,000 for a nine-person office to $550,000 for a 17-person office. And during the course of that debate, you're fairly free-ranging and you can go at the Premier's estimates and his functions and ask almost any question. This is what Levy said to Mr. Bennett. At the time of the Farris resignation, did you, Premier Bennett, receive a telephone call from the Prime Minister of Canada and the Minister of Justice of Canada, in which they informed him, Premier Bennett, that the Chief Justice was resigning. Did you, the Premier, were you told by your Attorney General what was happening? And Levy went on, and for once it was clear questioning by a member of the opposition, what reasons were given for the Chief Justice resigning? Some of us, said Levy, not lawyers and judges, want to know exactly what took place. Nobody has told us. And of course, he's dead right in that observation. We have only started to understand what was happening about this case because of the Vogel affair. Was the reason for the Chief Justice's resignation because there was some involvement in what became known as the Wendy King case? Because a woman was charged with keeping a common body house. And as Premier said to Bennett, who was sitting there quite intently, nobody wants to talk about it. We can talk about the Moran case. We can talk about the Riggs case. But the public of British Columbia has no understanding of what took place to you two years ago. It has, it goes on to say, is this my information, I'm quoting from Levy's speech in the House, where he has total immunity, if it's accurately reported, and I sometimes think the opposition forgets this function. It is my information that what took place was that Farris was picked up on a wiretap and that the wiretap was on an individual who was suspected of trafficking in drugs. And then he goes on to question a wiretap into a body house. And he finishes by repeating the questions a number of times, hammering the point. And of course, he was promptly drawn to his place by the, the committee chairman. Committee chairman, wasn't it? Committee chairman. The committee chairman said, oh, I don't know if you're entitled to ask these questions of uh, the Premier, after all, we're dealing with the administration of his office. You'll have to wait until you can ask him from the Attorney General under his estimates. Well, Bill Bennett got up at the end of Levy's very clear questioning and discourse and said, very bluntly, I have no intention of dealing with other areas of responsibility during my estimates. In other words, Bennett was asked directly by Levy, did you, at the time of the Farris resignation, get a phone call from the Prime Minister of Canada and the Minister of Justice asking, telling you that there was going to be a resignation and telling you what was happening? And Bennett refused to answer. I don't know whether Mr. Bennett got such phone calls. I don't know if the Prime Minister of Canada and or the Minister of Justice phoned him. They were valid questions. They got no answers. This matter will not, unfortunately, not nice to raise these things, but as Levy said, in two years, we don't know what happened. Why the top man in the system of justice in British Columbia fled from office with a resignation and a leave of absence after much messing around and delay by Otto Lang and Boralaskin. Webster with Barrett after the break. <laughs> Did you sleep late this morning, Mr. Barrett? No, I got caught in traffic. That was my fault. And you're very sorry about it. Oh, of course I'm sorry about it. I don't like to be late. I don't like anybody to be late with me for appointments, so I don't like to be late with other appointments. Maybe you're late for your opportunity to take over the government of British Columbia at the next election because Bennett seems to be getting into some kind of high gear. Mill rates reduced for school taxis. Welfare costs to the municipalities increased. $600 million surplus. Heroin, uh, heroin, 600, six, 600 million dollar surface, yeah. denticare scheme, yeah. all kinds of goodies, they're going to be fed out, while the opposition, under criticism for some of its tactics, seems to have lost the case in dirty tricks. Um, that case isn't over. Oh? Well, we're we're just into the estimates. We, we're now into the uh, committee stage, as you've described. We just started the estimates yesterday. 
we're now in a situation where we're not confined to the 15-minute gobbledygook as you've described it accurately in the question period where ministers can get up and evade. We're now in estimates. And that means there are a lot of questions to be asked. So therefore, instead of, uh, instead of constructive policy, constructive criticism of the government's forward-looking policies, you're going to dig back no. through the mud no, 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 and no, the no, dirty no. tricks? No, 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 no. There were serious questions raised by the very, uh, um, your very employer that have not been answered. That is, this uh, television studio. There are other serious questions. Also, there are positive questions that haven't been answered. If you uh, listened yesterday, as I know you did very closely, I talked about the railway, an oil refinery, steel proposals, the loss out of Rail West, one million unemployed across Canada with our share of well over 100,000. We're trying to find out what the government intends to do other than laissez-faire. The debates have really just started when we move into the estimates. But when Mr. Bennett went to, to your surprise for a seven-year moratorium on uranium mining and exploration, thereby dumping $30 million worth of live investment and work in British Columbia, you applauded. Look, I have always been opposed to radioactive materials mining in British Columbia. I think it should be made, the decision should be made on a rational basis. My position was clear from 1971 on. What uh, came out yesterday was that the Premier of the province did not tell the whole truth in the House about his trip to Europe and his position on uranium. When under pressure, he finally screamed out no, that he had not sold or attempted to sell uranium in Europe when he was there in 1977. And yet, uh, he said, all you do is do your research from uh, newspaper clippings. So yesterday, I tabled a correspondence from Etienne Reuter, who is the chairman of the Commission of U European Communities Office, to the president. And I'll read one quote from it. He said, the prime minister, that is, uh, the first minister of British Columbia, underlined his concern of his government to <coughs> find markets for the province's products and listed, amongst other things, uranium. Now, all I was trying to do was find out when Bill Bennett changed his position on uranium and when he decided to cancel the Bates Commission, which he did illegally, by the way. And that is the problem in dealing with Bill Bennett and this government. Two it's points, some, two know. points. Let me, let me get this one at a time. Your point was that 1977, when he went to the European com Common Market, the yes, yeah. that he made no bones about offering uranium for sale. Yes, with the only restriction being the federal government's uh, export restrictions at that time. And you're making the point that challenged in the House sometime later by you, rather than the newspapers, he had said he had not offered uranium That is correct. Yeah. You now produce part of the minutes of that European body in which it confirms that he did discuss That's the correct. prospect of the sale of uranium and other products, you must agree. That's correct. But from no, B.C. to Europe. No question about it. That's what he went there for. But he said, no, he did not discuss uranium, when indeed the uh, person who took the minutes confirmed that he did raise uranium. Well, Mr. Bennett had a partial answer in that 40-minute speech he made yesterday that, of course, he was uh, looking for uh, markets for coal, forestry, and other products Look, in BC. It's difficult in to get any answers out of Mr. Bennett. If you will notice in estimates, as soon as he gets the floor, he takes 30 minutes to go on a rambling gobbledygook speech avoiding any specific question. His father would have said, the answer is no, my friend, the, the opposition answer, is confused. The, the, his father would have said yes, no, or no comment. I operated the same way, and most other ministers do. It is impossible to deal with Bill Bennett. We still don't have an answer in the questions yesterday about the Gloucester properties, Gloucester estates. Going what back he, into the land freeze. He, going back in the land freeze. He said he wanted it. Here's Gloucester going to court. Where are the amendments? Does he intend to protect that land? We don't have answers. Well, we got a, finally, he got so angry at McDonald, he shouted no, that he hadn't uh, raised uranium when indeed he had. Another half-truth or mistruth, whatever way you want to describe it in the House, and it's impossible to get some sense out of that man in the House. He did say, as Ocean Falls is closing down, that Ocean Falls would have a viable opportunity to realize its new potential. <laughs> Jack, he also promised to go to uh, Squamish to explain to people in Squamish why Rail West would uh, close. He didn't uh, bother doing that, he just closed it. He's never visited Ocean Falls. He's never made contact with the people in areas where he's made these decisions. He won't deal, frankly and honestly, with the facts as they are there, or will he share with the House where he's going from here? 
you must confess he's in a very fina healthy financial position yeah. due to the uh, energy revenue increases. Well, that's wonderful, Jack. I think it's terrific. And it was Jack Davis who made probably one of the better speeches in the House yesterday pointing out that the increase in revenue surplus was out of the increase in natural gas sales. The irony of that is that Bill Bennett and Phillips, who you mentioned yesterday, were the two most vigorous opponents against the British Columbia Petroleum Corporation. And it's the NDP Petroleum Corporation that is providing for the surpluses in British Columbia, as Jack Davis said yesterday. Yeah, I didn't really want to do a piece attacking Phillips while you were sitting in the studio, but I must say, in all honesty, that was the worst speech I've had in the House in a long time. No comment. Well, I'm saying it. I mean, you prepared even to agree with me? Look, I've I mean, why be so through, shy? Well, what, what can I add? I've sat through that nonsense ever since that man's been in the house. Well, now, you've got some duties in your side of the house who don't make the best speeches in the world either. Look, Jack, no one is angelic and no one is totally demonic. You but there, there, is, there are people in that house who do not make any sense at all. Your man like it has the answer. What's that? Live cable vision or other permanent cover coverage by Great. television Great. in the house, and all of a sudden, the speeches would get shorter, better prepared. They might be used on a clip in the news on the various television stations, and the standard of de well, debate would drop 500 percent. I think it'd be a darn good experiment. I think probably we would, we would replace Summonex for the most part. Uh, the, uh, the fact is that most of the legislature is very routine and very dull. There are high points, and there are frequent low points. The most difficult uh, people to deal with are people like you mentioned who you saw yesterday, Mr. Phillips. Quite I can't add it much to that. Question. Yeah. If you were in power, of course, having started the Marguerite, you would have run the Marguerite if you did to patch her bottom with putty. No, not to patch your bottom with putty. When Lloyd's of London tells it's okay, when the U.S. Coast Guard tells it's okay, when the Canadian Coast Guard tells it's okay, then obviously they know more about shipping than I do. The cost of replacing the Marguerite, the cost of disrupting the service up north, are going to be many times more what it would have cost to do the one major refitting of the Marguerite, and that is new engines. Now, they've made a foolish decision, but they're so stubborn they won't back off the decision, and the taxpayers are going to lose a great deal of money over it. I took advice from people in the field. I didn't care about their politics. I listened to people who had the advice to give. Listen, he's going to be real tough on him in Victoria if the Marguerite isn't back by the next election. Jack, uh, I don't understand that decision. He admits himself to me on the well, air on Monday he... morning that it was badly handled. Well, if it was badly handled, why doesn't he do what his father did and what I did, just stand up and say, look, I think we've made a mistake here, and we're going to change our mind. Now, there's nothing wrong with admitting that publicly. Just say, look, I've had a second look. We've made a mistake, and we're going back to the original position. And you would give him credit and praise him for it? Well, of course. He's only done it once in the time that he's been there was when they eliminated Seaboard. He said, by gosh, we've made a mistake. And we went back to the house and got it corrected in one day. No filibuster or anything else. Dave Barrett, leader of the NDP and Webster, after the break. <laughs> The budget. Yeah. With the worst will in the world, Mr. Barrett, you must concede that with all that extra money, Mr. Bennett is in a fine, healthy position to increase gain allowances yeah. if he's going to do that, to bring in his partial dental care or his yeah. universal sure. dental care, $30 million. And that really puts him in a very strong position to reorganize his party for the next election. No question that the uh, budget of the province is healthy. And again, as Jack Davis indicated yesterday, a significant factor of that was the Petroleum Corporation. That's good. I'm glad the Socreds have not touched the British Columbia Petroleum Corporation, even though they, they you know, especially Phillips fought against it. The fact is uh, that if you examine what Bill Bennett has been saying over the last few years in terms of budget restraint and his own formula that he lectures the federal government and again lectured the House on yesterday about limiting provincial expenditures growth to 1% below the provincial products growth and, as a matter, and then returning tax money to the taxpayers, well, 
his formula is out by 100%, and he should be cutting taxes and allowing people to spend their money on their own choice in the economy rather than hoarding the money that we are making out of sale of our natural gas. What's this business about cut that's going to have a stabilization fund? I haven't quite got that cleared yet. Well, we don't have it clear either. We, we know that uh, there are dramatically increased uh, revenues from natural gas simply because Mexico forced the price up in the U.S. market. Even though uh, the provincial Socreds dragged their feet on that price, we lost approximately $240 million by underpricing our gas from 76 to 79. The Tories' election was the breakthrough, but that's a separate story. Now, how they're going to set aside the funds, we're not clear. But uh, surely with his increased revenues, the greatest relief should go back to the taxpayer rather than stuffing it in the sock and obviously to make a political decision to buy votes next time around. But that's a choice they've made. But let us not forget that we are heavily overtaxed at this time in British Columbia. You would have cut taxes more? Yes, uh, certainly the move to cut taxes would have been allowing people to have more disposable income in their pockets to deal with two very serious problems, high interest rates and high inflation. Those well, are the ways of dealing about with About the high interest rates. Mr. Bennett did a lot of good with his $200 million plan yeah. uh, for the subsidization of mortgages through credit unions, of all things, yeah. to nine and three quarters percent. Now, uh, should he be doing more of that right now? Well, Jack, uh, it's welcome. Again, uh, part of an idea that was passed in the House during our administration. I have uh, with me a copy of Bill 86, the Savings and Trust Corporation, that was passed through the House by the NDP. We set up a joint committee between the BC Central Credit Union and the Finance Department to implement the program of a new financial institution. A report was prepared, given to the government in the spring of 76, and kept secret ever since. Well, you couldn't blame them for that. It was your act. They weren't going to do it, were they? Well, This was your look, kind of near bank that you had set look, up, but I didn't don't, implement. I don't have a paranoia about the source of ideas. If there were good Socred ideas, we continued them. If there were good NDP ideas, they should continue them too. Are you suggesting that that's what he did with the $200 million? He started on the road to it. The varying estimates of the cost of that particular $200 million range from Mr. Chabot's statement of some $40 million down to Mr. Curtis's statement of $11 million. Now, I'm saying that Mr. Curtis is probably more correct than Mr. Chabot. The total direct cost of the $200 million guaranteed in terms of a lower interest rate out of the credit unions will be $11 million. That's a subsidy to a mortgage rate. This whole act was designed to do exactly that, not only for mortgages, but for co-ops and small businesses as well. There's a limit to that, though, Mr. Bell. Well, I'll tell you what the limit is. When we take $200 million at $11 million subsidy, and that's, that's money that's not out of general revenue, what you do is guarantee the inflow of that money into the economy. Five times that amount is $1 billion it would cost the government $55 million, a very small amount of money, even out of the surplus, to put $1 billion into the housing market in British Columbia today just by using this act and expanding the program. Well, a little more than that because the spread of interest has now gone up to 16 17%, even if it cost $100 million. Jack, even if it cost $100 million, we get over a $1 billion into B.C.'s economy in construction right here in B.C. now. Here is the legislative authority to do it. Here's the explanation. And the Socreds voted for this bill, Jack. They voted for this bill. So you're saying that one of the big sins of Bennett right now is while he started in the right road with a mortgage subsidy through credit unions, if he increased it fivefold, he'd be a hero. Fivefold, the cost, uh, even if you're, out, uh, you're outside figure, and I, I, won't, uh, I won't disagree with that, of $100 million, but it's certainly well, below, well above what Curtis says it would cost, then we would be in a position of cutting into unemployment and putting some competitive edge out there enforcing other corporations to look, banks and trust companies, to look at those mortgage rates they're charging in BC. Ocean Falls. A mistake. Was that a place where you poured money down the drain? No, not at all. As a matter of fact, during our administration, the highest loss was just under $2 million. This year, the loss of Ocean Falls was running close to $20 million. The delay in making decisions around Ocean Falls for four years is the major factor in increasing those losses. If we were going to a chipboard, if we were going to other directions, the information to make those decisions was available three years ago. There was no decision at the political level as to what it wanted to do with Ocean Falls. First of all, it messed around with the possibility of selling 
to uh, with a Kruger of, of uh, Quebec. Then it didn't know whether or not to include it in BRIC. Then it wasn't sure whether or not it wanted to expand its, its uh, fiber holdings. All of this delay, delay, delay led to the increased losses, finally to the closure. And that is administrative bungling, but it's not confined to Ocean Falls. The same with the Marguerite, the same in other areas across the province. Brick, of course, has been one of the great shining things in Bennett. Wonderful, Say, wonderful. You fought that all the way. No, I'm not You've now withdrawn your criticism no. that he Look. took what you bought and gave it to the public in free shares. Jack, how do you give something back to people they already own? What they did, what he did do is give part of it back to people and sold the rest off. Let's examine what's in BRIC. Forty million dollars worth of assets bought by the NDP, all of them opposed by social credit. Seventy percent of it sold off and raises over five hundred million dollars. Almost eight times what uh, the uh, NDP spent originally four years earlier or three years earlier. But that stock promotion. Stock promotion is not bad, but it proves that our purchase had a darn good equity base. No question about it, especially can sell. Forty million dollars now pumped up to over five hundred million dollars in the marketplace. There has been no exciting new innovative job creation investment out of BRIC. Buying in an M&B is a good, solid, conservative position. Piddling around with inflated values in Kaiser shares after Kaiser has creamed his own company by selling off his Richland assets to Dome is dumb in my opinion. Kaiser now is down to around $31. When the offer was made, it was around $44 for Kaiser shares. Why, would, why in the world, I don't think Halliwell now will go through with the deal. He's admitted that he's taking he a second. He can back off that Yes, one. luckily he can. But if you notice, the uh, share value on the market has taken a drop because people have lost confidence in the ability of a decision-making process to go into the venture area where they said they were going. In other words, if Halliwell had taken over Mac and Blow, you'd have said, hooray, hooray, hooray. Well, he bought a share of Mac and Blow. That I don't think it's necessary for Brick to take over Mac and Blow, and I wouldn't have said hooray. That's not the point of Brick. The point of Brick, we were told, was to go into venture capital and create new jobs, buying into an already established firm that may have problems in terms of fiber supply in the near future and put its profit position a little bit lower is not the goal of BRIC. The goal was to create secondary and tertiary industry, like the rail car plant, like continuing the negotiations with the Japanese for a steel mill, like setting up a, uh, an oil refinery in this province, which the Premier alluded to a bit yesterday, like dealing with secondary and tertiary jobs that have to have that infusion mm -hmm. of indigenous capital get it going. Mm -hmm. It's anyway, not been there. He, forestry, he took your peer support, took his professional advice, yeah. he's putting 1.4 billion Good stuff. vitally needed stuff in to regenerate the forests and the silviculture of BC. Definitely needed, a good move, much delayed. Uh, I wish that we had had the Pierce report uh, completed when we were in office. At least we got it started. At least some of it is being followed. I think, regardless of uh, blame on anybody, I think we may be about 25 years late for maintaining the same level of fiber supply that we should have here in the province of British Columbia. And your call shortly to Dave Barrett, leader of the NDP, Webster, from Czech and Victoria, after the break. I won't embarrass you, or I didn't embarrass Mr. Bennett either, really, by referring to these, these Dread, the dreadful behavior by members of both parties in the hall. But have you told your members to behave more like gentlemen in the hall than they have done up to now? You can never predict the behavior of any member in the House in the B.C. legislature. I think that uh, it is not the kind of behavior that should be condoned, but I think it should be understood. It is part and parcel of the history of this province that there are intense differences of opinion gentlemen are polite and ladies are polite. However, in the history of BC, debates have spilled over into the corridor yeah. and they may continue to. One thing I want to warn people about, never forget that the British parliamentary system is the adversary system where feelings are strong, opinions are strongly held and forcefully said. If we ever move away from that, and I'm not condoning the kind of behavior that went on the hallway, but if we ever move away from the advocacy system and move to the lobbying power position as in the states, 
then political choices will be terribly narrow in this country. But it, would it not be common sense and normal decency now for you, your party to agree to pairing on occasions to allow cabinet ministers yeah. properly to do their jobs? No question about that, Jack. Uh, let us go back over the facts. When we were in power, we gave a pairing, the opposition gave pairing. One of the things we did was we invited our counterparts in the opposition to federal conferences. When I went back east, I invited the leader of the opposition, Bill Bennett, to go, and his expenses were paid as a responsible part of the political system. Not once since social credit has been powered has that reciprocal, a decent thing to do, been done. Now, if the government wants to continue the policy that every other government in Canada has and the NDP had in British Columbia, that is taking opposition leaders or spokespersons to important conferences, then of course we can give pairing. But that is behind the scenes well, and we never hear about it. The fact is that Bill Bennett has never once reciprocated on the same basis on the sense of decency of making sure that the opposition went along. For he, instance, this conference coming up in Calgary, I think it is, of the four Western Premiers. Right. You tell me that you did, in fact, ask the leader of the opposition at public I, expense I asked to go him, to things. I asked him to go to a number of things. The energy conference he went to, expenses paid, as well as the Liberal and Conservative leader. Why not? It's important the they Bennett be there. won't do it. Not once have I been asked or any other member of the opposition been asked to an important conference. Yes, Not sir. it was brand new, it was practice in the House under the NDP. You're suggesting he's very small-minded on these things. Well, I don't know how else to interpret it. Surely to goodness in a mature structure such as we should have in British Columbia where the opposition has a role to play and recognize when we were in government that the same thing should be carried on now. If they want to cry about pairing because they can't go back east, why don't they do what was always done under our administration, make sure that the paired person went to the conference? Pipelines. Uh, there was reference in the House yesterday to your original plan to bring oil by rail tank yes. car from Alaska down. Yep. Uh, when I was talking to Lalonde, the new energy, the retread energy minister, um, I pointed out to him quite bluntly, I thought, that we've got massive tankers on the West Coast now yeah. into Puget Sound. Yeah. What's all the panic about? Is it not a fact that we are stuck with big tankers on the west coast from Alaska down, despite the double talk from Clark, Trudeau and company. We have been stuck with the big tankers uh, since the early 70s. The uh, real opportunity to avoid the tankers was lost in the early 70s. What the dispute about now is doubling, tripling and quadrupling the number of tankers on the coast. There are a number of options. One of them is the railroad. <coughs> uh, Mr. Davis was incorrect when he talked about uh, yesterday the uh, Queen's University guided uh, ground transport people not being involved. As a matter of fact, it was Cecil Law, the professor of that particular section of the university, who helped us. The fact is there are options. I was in Alaska. I spoke as leader of the opposition. I spoke to a special joint session of the House and Senate last year. I went to Washington, D.C last year, along with Captain Harry Terry, who is no NDPer by any means, to revive the idea of an alternate method of moving oil. The Gats Corporation, the States, moves over 500,000 barrels of oil a day in the United States on unit trains now. The same kind of thing can be done. It'll be a long-term good investment for BC. Right now, a word of warning to the telephone callers. Mr. Barrett will be here till just before 10 o'clock, and then Grace McCarthy will follow him. But call the normal numbers in Vancouver. Linda will pick you up there and feed them into the system here. But I think I'll take a break and then go straight to telephone calls with Dave Barrett after this refreshing pause. <laughs> go ahead from Vancouver to Mr. Barrett. Go ahead, if you of uh, housing alone, uh, I suppose you took this up as part of your non-confidence motion, but I don't think it would be unreasonable for you to ask for uh, Bennett's resignation on the Socrates' uh, apathetic attitude towards the housing problem. Uh, but my question is, uh, which of the government's spending priorities do you feel should be put behind the problem of housing so that more money could be allotted for housing at uh, low mortgage interest rates? And uh, I'm in support. Uh, with about a okay, billion dollar proposal. Okay, made, look, I, think I don't think that there needs to be a massive intervention by the government directly in construction. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. I believe what should be involved is releasing the funds into the many options that exist. The one area where I encourage direct government participation is in co-ops and financing co-ops. But that's an area that community groups and people have to decide for themselves. The money should be put into the marketplace and let it flow at that point now. You must confess that we stuck with maybe 50 million extra for nurses, 100 million extra for hospital employees, all these massive oh, increases. There are massive increases, but there are massive increases in return for out of the BC Petroleum Corporation. Again, as Davis pointed out, we've made out of that one company started by the NDP, we've made $1,480,000,000. The money has been made to spend on those services. We have a 30-year supply of natural gas, proved up reserves, so we can budget accordingly on that basis. And whose estimates will this debate come on housing? It'll come under Mr. Chabot and Mr. Curtis both. Both uh, ministers will be involved. Thank you, sir. Next call, please. Vancouver. Mr. Mr. Stubich disclosed one day that there was a, a notorious Nanaimo fund, I believe he called it, out of which uh, Bob Nanaimo. Williams was paid $80,000 yes, sure. so he would step down for you to get elected. Uh, and he indicated that this fund was paid from government salaries no. to the members of the legislature. Not true. There is an Nanaimo Commonwealth uh, Fund that is a separate society under the Societies Act. It does not pay government money to anybody. Bob Williams was intended to be an employee of the fund. However, the fund never did get to him because uh, there is a development. They did do some work, but the party also had Williams hired as an organizer. So he was divided in terms of both jobs. There was no government money paid to Bob. He got, got money. He got the money as agreed, but it was... Yeah, obvious. he was hired as agreed. No question about that, and that's no big secret fund or no secret. How did you get through, ma'am? You used to haunt me on radio, remember? Next call, please. Uh, the hydrofoil uh, rumor I heard, the $900,000 loan or grant, are these Eastern people or friends of the government? Is there any hydrofoil? clarification on this? Is that it? You mean jet file? Which one? Yes. Correct, yeah. You mean for an auxiliary use on the Seattle run? In conjunction with the Marguerite. The, the, the sketchy details we have at this point are that uh, the hydrofoil is to be leased to a citizens group in Victoria where the backup funding is to be given by the British Columbia Development Corporation. It appears it involves about three and a half million dollars over a six month period. We don't have much more information on it than that. Two but whatever they make, uh, Hawaii has cut them out because yeah. you can't see it because it's great. Well, the the the, the this before and they kept running the logs to get damaged. It's true that they've had serious problems with the hydrofoil. The, the, the disastrous thing about all of this is that the uh, what now appears to be the fact is that it would have been far far cheaper to put the marguerite in the first class condition and forget these exotic ideas that are now quixotic ideas about bringing people up. Thank you. Seattle. From Nanaimo, go ahead, please. What can the ordinary voter do to bring pressure to Mr. Bennett to change his mind on his several miscalculations? Well, there. Are, look, the opposition uh, opposes, uh, the government proposes, and we disagree in the center. The ordinary voter has to assume the responsibility of becoming as well informed as possible. One thing I would suggest is to become a subscriber to Hansard, and if you've had a good solid meal, sit down and uh, after a cautioning it with a good cup of coffee, and read through Hansard every single day. Become involved in a political party, the party that's closest to your own philosophy, and get directly involved in political action. There is no doubt that political awareness in this province is highly polarized between the NDP and the social credit. Question, question. Yeah. Is there a plan by certain elements of social credit and liberals to revive at all costs and any expense in the way of guarantees to Big Iona or anybody else, so that in the next election they can siphon off 7 or 10 percent of you and ensure your defeat. It sounds like quite a good idea. Well, I don't know if there is such a plan. The it would person, be a good plan for them to do that. Well, the persons to ask uh, that of that plan would be people who make the decisions in social credit and liberals. It appears that uh, by newspaper reports that uh, that may be part of it, but I have no knowledge of such a plan. Yeah, but you would be fearful if it were effective. No, I'm not ever fearful. The reemergence of a third Look, party could cut you out of power. Next time Jack, around. whatever the citizens of this province are offered a choice politically, they will make their minds up. The uh, reappearance of the Liberals or Conservatives or another form of coalition would not be unusual in the history of British Columbia. There has always been an adaption or an amoeba-like approach to politics to stop the NDP from getting elected. In fact, every night when you say your prayers, Mr. Barrett, you say, 
please let the coalition of liberals and social credit fly apart and then we can beat them on the floor of the House. I rarely say uh, prayers about political events. <laughs> Uh, I do say uh, some quiet prayers about other events in the world, but rarely about political events. I don't think God messes around with political campaigns. Uh, Victoria, go ahead, please. Hello, Mr. Barrett? Yes. Uh, I wonder if you've given any thought to uh, any modifications in the Law Societies Act. I think it's to Jack Webster's credit that he's, he's kept before the public this, uh, it seems to me, rather... Uh, exaggerated notion that the lawyers can patrol and, yeah. and uh, judge themselves. The first, uh, uh, yeah, look, I think, look. In the Vogel affair, it seems to me that, that Williams is criticized, but he's just been doing what Canadian, maybe BC lawyers have been doing for years, judging themselves. With one difference, with one difference. And I think, like all things in terms of reform with the professions, it's a long, slow, arduous task. Incidentally, Webster's position is not new in this regard. When my old days, when I worked with the John Howard Society 15 years ago, uh, Jack was on radio raising the same issues. There was one significant... With a remarkable lack of success. Exactly. <laughs> one significant change that was made that is still there under the Socreds, and that is we established the Justice Councils, which was the first move to draw in local citizenry in an examination of justice. Well, I, don't, I don't believe that this whole Vogel affair and this debate, separate from Dick Vogel, would have taken place had not those Justice Councils been in place. Obviously, out of these experiences will come the next move to some other form of policing the professions. The first motion put on the order paper about policing the professions was way back in the 30s by old E.E. E. Winch, who wanted a House committee structure to deal with this. It was never specifically formulated, but he wanted a House committee. It's taken us this long to get Citizens Justice Community Council commissions. What the next step is from there, I don't know. But I'll tell you, out of something bad, Something good, I think, will happen in well, terms look, of these uh, uh, Having watched the, the program yesterday where Mr. Barber was on uh, and... Uh, Leggett. Mr. Leggett, yeah. Yeah. I hope you'll take Leggett's advice rather than Alec McDonald's because I think it was on... It may have been, Jack, on your radio show where Alec McDonald certainly with Presbyterian indignation rejected any suggestion that, that anyone, any lay person would have any... Well, say in, in, in the deliberations of, of well, the Law Society. To, to Alec's credit, it was Alec McDonald who in, instituted the, uh, the, uh, the community group's involvement, the Justice Council involvement. There is a debate in our own group over this, but we have moved significantly. The Justice Councils are, thank goodness the Socreds have left the councils alone. The next move will have to be some form of greater participation by citizens. And you're committed to you're committed to forwarding that, are you? Uh, well, of course, I'm not opposed to it. Next call, thank you, sir, Vancouver. Yes, sir. Yes. Such a depressing picture. I wonder if you can tell me anything about what is being planned with government action in the fishing industry. I'm speaking of the three levels of uh, amendments to the labor code for collective bargaining. Make it a legal fact with full protection of the law. And then with the federal yep. government, control foreign investment, and then provincial action to ensure that BC's fishing resources are processed here. There are two separate problems. The labor matter is very complex, not easily resolved. Our, uh, our Labor Committee of Caucus will be meeting with the fishermen sometime this week, and I understand that the fishermen will also be meeting with the Socred uh, Labor Group as well, although I'm not sure. I think that's the case. In terms of the control of the fisheries, we warned uh, Mr. Mayor when he was the Minister of Consumer Affairs what was happening uh, one year ago in terms of the offshore financing in the fishing industry of British Columbia. It is a classic case of overpricing uh, capital establishments, overfinancing, deliberately crumbling from within, controlling the markets, and then scooping up the profits on the long run. Cargill tried it with a move to try and take over Maplewood after buying Panko. It's a classic case. One of the problems, of course, is that the Fishermen's Union is not in the eyes of the federal government a union at all. Yep. The show workers are organized under provincial federation. Right. It's a mess. Provincial it's and the federal government controls foreign investment. It's an overlapping uh, problem. It's a heck of a mess. There are no simple solutions. Question? Yeah. CPR freight strike to Vancouver Island. The whole island is on tenterhooks. How long is it going to last? When are supplies going to get shot? Who can do anything about it? Nobody. Well, I think that uh, the provincial minister of labor has done the one right thing immediately, asking for a federal conciliator. 
He's good, isn't he, Heinrich? Well, he's certainly an improvement over the kind of attitudes we've seen displayed by some of the backbenchers. Heinrich, uh, you know, has, has a certainly a more open approach to labor matters in this province. That's good for all labor and all management in this province. The first move that he's made is a good one, calling for a federal conciliator. I don't know what the government uh, plans to do in terms of the massive tie-ups at the ferry terminals. This is not the SoCred's fault, the government's fault, this particular strike but they will have to deal with some kind of traffic management, perhaps even putting on later sailings or, or nighttime sailings just with the Alberni alone for truck ferry service. That wouldn't be hot? I don't think it would be hot if uh, the kind of expense... Remember, the Alberni has just come back into service uh, after having had that unfortunate accident a year ago. If they want to accelerate sailings based on the uh, Alberni just being back in service, that's a separate matter. On your plate this afternoon in the House, anything big or another afternoon of brilliant debate? Well, we will go back on the Premier's estimates. Uh, we will suffer through those uh, tedious and boring repetitive speeches uh, by the Premier and we'll continue to ask questions. We will try to go after the answers that uh, we didn't get yesterday. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. Next, the Honourable Grace, McCall Grace McCarthy, Minister of Human Resources. After. <laughs> Grace McCarthy is Minister of Human Resources. Grace, you're a, I was going to say an old tyler in political battles, <laughs> but I didn't say that to you. But you've been through many I a political war, don't. haven't you? I've been 17 years in public life, and I've enjoyed it all. While you look young and glamorous and gorgeous, don't you feel rather tattered at the edges with the heat no. you've taken and your government has taken and dirty tricks, etc.? Not at all, no. I, um, I'm uh, meeting the challenge, and I'm... Uh, I think we've had a lot more criticism than we have deserved, and uh, that's fair. That's the political world. We volunteered for it, and we do get battered once in a while. I don't know of any other political party that could have withstood the battering uh, that we've had in the last six months, as well as our party has. I don't know if you have withstood the battering. I think we have. Your party organization may be in a shambles. Oh, I don't believe so. I think it's stronger than it's uh, been in a long time are since the still, 1975 election. Are you still in control of the grassroots organization of the party? Are you the Am brain I behind the party? Yes. Am I personally? It's very difficult when one is uh, is a uh, minister to be uh, really strongly involved in the political process, um, you know, the party process. And uh, we have a very good organization that we've been rebuilding this past few months, very few months, and it's coming together very well. A new president has been uh, established and a new party organization. We're adding to it, and, uh, and I think that uh, we're well on the way to a very good revised organization. It was BC TV News Hour which was after you, after the party in detail and dirty tricks, but I've got to throw... Can we put it another way? Uh, it was BC TV uh, News that uh, harassed me greatly over the uh, whole uh, uh, situation uh, and allegations and innuendo uh, regarding the Eckhart report, and uh, yes, it was this station that did that. For well, a fair thee well. I know, and I'm going to continue with it because I've never gone at you on this at all, and I want to give you an opportunity to tell me a couple Thank of you. inside things. You must have been horrified and mortified by the whole dirty trick business and the question of the phony letters. Well, I think it was. I, I was disappointed. Was it I was, stupidity? Yes. Uh, in a way, it was. Uh, it was um, two people within uh, an organization of 80,000. That's been the. Um, membership of the what Social Credit Party. What did you say party. when you found out about these tapes lying around for a year and then being well, the sent out? Well, the tapes weren't, the, the tapes were not, it's like minutes of a meeting lying around, uh, tapes or minutes of a meeting because they're electronic minutes of and a meeting. And you hadn't had the tapes, had you? No, I had not. And if you had, what would you have done? Well, if I'd been at the meeting, if I had heard the statements, I would have been appalled and I would have said, that's not our policy. Many, many people throughout our uh, our party have said that's not our, our policy it's never been a direction of our party so why do two people get up and say that and it was stupidity on their part they have admitted that themselves and it should have been they should have been uh, uh, right away just right I away expected you I was watching that. it closely and Bennett was in, the premier was in Hawaii and I expected you to come front and center with a claymore or a hatchet and chop off heads you didn't you sat in the weeds. Well, I was, uh, that's true. I was, uh, I had, um, the Premier was away out of the... Uh, you were Deputy Premier. I was wishing to uh, 
to receive and, t and not chop off heads, but perhaps give uh, people who were in a difficult position an opportunity to explain themselves. Uh, I want to tell you that in that particular month or two-week period and the ensuing uh, two weeks after that, in that month, I was in 28 cities in that month. In other words, I was doing my job as a minister, and that wasn't counting Vancouver and Victoria. I take those as my two bases anyway, but in, in addition to that, I was in 28 cities. While, while your uh, news uh, people were working full-time and several of them around the clock to try to take people's uh, words out of context and put them together on a newscast, I was doing the business of the province. I was in 28 cities and I was responding uh, perhaps at an, at an airport in a two-second interview uh, or even a 20-minute interview of which you use maybe one half a second or one second. So, the, you know, it really wasn't a contest uh, at all. It was not You were unfairly dealt with. I think that uh, there was a lot of misrepresentation and innuendo and exaggeration. I think it was, it was all, all right, of those let me things. Ask, let me ask you a plain old-fashioned Webster question about admitted facts. Yes. And I'm talking about the $65,000 in cash, which wasn't accounted for until an amended return in the Social Credit Party expenses. And here you have a senior party man whipping out $1,000 bills. Did you know that was happening? No, I didn't, Jack. And Would you uh, have tolerated party, that? No, I think, um, I think that my record in, uh, in keeping uh, records and so on in any organization that I've had anything to do with is better than that. Um, I think uh, that it, it, it was a sloppy situation. And uh, I know that funds were not used irregularly, but, the, but uh, I think that report has already been made. I think that everybody's knuckles have been wrapped for that. And that's part of the Premier's reorganization of the party, which I referred to earlier. And so I therefore, in the new reorganization of the party, is it laid down there will be no cash transactions Set by authorized check through the party funds. The party is taking care of that in. in you didn't very, know about this. No, not at all. I, mean, I it's want to. It's your party want, not knowing how much money they'd spent in an election, especially please, sixty-five thousand dollars. Yes, please let me explain my my uh, part in terms of party uh, funding. When I was the president of the party and had a very strong political role within the party and a day-to-day -day political role, I made it a point then because I knew and everyone around me knew that I would be seeking public office. I made a point then that I would ha have nothing to do with collection of funds or knowledge of funds that came. As long as I had sufficient funds to operate the organization, that was my only concern and that was provided I was completely apart from that kind of thing. And so because of that, I really do not have a very good awareness of the, of the financial uh, organization. And I've never been involved in the overall campaign financially at all. Not at all. I'm not opting out or copying out. Mm -hmm. I, feel that, I feel that the party must have very good organization and a very tight uh, control of their, of their funds and that is being implemented at the present time. I'm satisfied. I will expect that as a party member and I'm satisfied that that is happening now. One final question on this aspect of things, Grace McCarthy. Uh, will you be cleared on the allegation of Gracie's finger in the Prolipchin report? Of course, because I, I, I'm satisfied that I will be, because there is nothing uh, incorrect about the Eckhart report. And I should really reiterate for you the fact that when a commissioner is appointed to bring in redistribution of, of, of boundaries, that report is his report. And he can change that report as he wishes. He can alter it as he wishes. When it is in the government's hands, it, it is then up to the government to either accept or all of it, part of it, or reject it all. We chose to adopt the whole thing. And I believe that you will find that uh, certainly what I regret most of anything is that the intimation of wrongdoing against a very respected gentleman, Judge Eckhart, who has an an absolutely uh, clear and, uh, uh, and uh, tremendous uh, record of achievement and, uh, and respect in this province <coughs> has even been questioned by the opposition. I think that's a very sad thing. One final question. I can't remember all the details myself now, but you were supposed to have dinner or something in the Laurel Point Hotel at some date. Did you ever attempt to influence Eckhart to change his report? Not at all. 
not to give at you all. The I would not have any part in influencing the judge on his report. Uh, it was open to all members of the legislature. It was mem open to all members of the public if they wished to give uh, a submission to Judge Eckhart in, in their own uh, uh, interests. Uh, constituency. We did not do that as a constituency, and I did not do it as a member. However, that was open to me. Grace McCarthy after the break. <laughs> The questions people are asking of you as Minister of Human Resources, with your hundred odd million dollar increase in your budget, do you plan to increase gain levels in the new budget? A difficult question, I know it's kind of coming, but an indication please. It's not difficult at all, yes I do. By how much? That's a little difficult. I'd like to uh, reserve uh, the uh, announcement uh, There will be increases later. in mm -hmm. gain. There will be. That includes uh, <coughs> handicapped allowances and gain allowances. There will allowances. be increases in um, the income assistance levels, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, that recognizes, of course, since we added $32 million to the gain uh, last year, in April of last year, and changed the gain uh, program considerably to make it more uh, streamlined, to give a better service to our, our people on income assistance. Um, we know since that date, since April of 1979, that there have been uh, great increases in the cost of, of living. That will be announced when? Within a month? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And be effective as of the following month's allowances. Will that be correct? I would like to leave that also because I'm still working with the Treasury Board on this whole subject. I remember. I had you on the air at the time when you streamlined the program. Yes. When you took away s most of the special allowances. Well, that's a misconception uh, that the opposition likes to sell. That uh, We did take away uh, special needs grants where uh, those in offices throughout the province were able to give um, uh, a special amount Five, of money. Up to five hundred dollars. If somebody came to them and, and asked for something special. But the problem with that, Jack, was that there were people, the squeaky wheels were getting the attention and those who lived in Puskupi in need were not and all of the other people in the province. So we said let's take this away from the local level and let's give more to people to look after their own. I explained that to you on a program mm -hmm. a year ago. Since that time the opposition has has used the poor once again in the political as political pawns and said oh we've taken something away special needs are still there for those in need they have to go through the regional manager there's no question of that but they have been given far more on income assistance in april of nineteen seventy nine which take care of some of the of the overages which they used to go to their social worker for including telephone and hydro those were all included in april for the very first time so that uh, criticism is one which, which does nothing to assist the poor people on, on, in our province. And I, I really won't one, accept that yeah, criticism. I've got that clear. That special needs are still available but cannot be handled by line social workers, must be done through regional managers. That's right. And, and, and also I want to say that we are stressing independence if, as much as we can. Instead of saying to people who are on income assistance, we are there to help in time of need, but we are also there in, t in, in this time of need to assist you to become independent. And there are many people who are on income assistance that once that they get into an employment situation do not have to be on income assistance and can be taken off. That spirit of independence is implied in taking away that special needs category and put it in, putting it into a crisis needs. People who are on low income, who are on minimum wage, when their uh, toaster breaks down, they can't run to an office. They have to budget their dollars. They have far more dollars to budget with, and we expect the same accountability within their household to look after those things as we do for people who are on very low income. Just one point there. Can you be accused of squeezing the rent levels by your overall umbrella system, including telephone, hydro, and rent overage? No, uh, we have since we have increased the um, uh, the all of the uh, support monies and so on since last April. We have, of course, come into a very difficult housing crisis, mm -hmm. so they're attendant. That's why we are addressing that in this uh, in this next little while, as you asked me to do. Good. Three assistant. short questions. Are you going to stop this business of the advertising by lawyers for babies? 
or is it acceptable if it goes through the court and the human resources system? I think it's uh, not acceptable to me that there should be advertising at all done. Quite honestly, I find that repulsive. Uh, the same lawyer who, who placed the ad in this last week, which has given, been given some publicity, is the same lawyer who placed the ad two years ago. There were amendments made by my predecessor, Mr. Van de Zelm, at that time, which made it mandatory for all people to report to the superintendent of child welfare. We are studying this case, this present case at the present time. I will have more to say on it because we have an imbalance in the province at the present time in fact in North America but British Columbia is the same we have 1,000 adopted adopting parents available with approved homes coming into our system are something like 30 newborn babies who are adoptable babies and so that imbalance uh, really the supply demand situation I think makes it mandatory for us to take a look at the Adoption Act once again. You'd like to chop it off make it all through human resources? No I wouldn't. I like the idea of private placements as well. There are only about five percent of the adoptions no in this province. No advertising by lawyers. But no advertising. Here, here. Here, no, here. None whatsoever. Aren't you heartbroken that the Hudson American trip was cancelled? One of your great joys and they go and they wreck their cars and just chop the whole thing up. Wasn't that a shame? Uh, Jack, uh, the decision to not go to, uh, to the California market is one which was made by the travel industry and the finance ministry uh, this year. Uh, I think it would have been a good year to go. Uh, you know, we have a very good image in the United States at the present time because of the Tehran situation. That, don't you think, don't you agree with Premier Bennett? Let's see if I can trap you this way. <laughs> when he told me that with a look of disgust on his face, my interpretation that the marguerite was badly handled. Yes, one of the things that hasn't been said, speaking of being badly handled, the positives have never been told. I was travel industry minister when we took over the marguerite from the, from NDP. the NDP. And you know, it was losing almost three quarters of a million dollars a year under the socialist government. Nobody has told the positive that we took that that uh, sailing and we marketed it properly and we put the the as much of free enterprise into a governmental situation as we could and made it into a paying proposition but no. nobody has documented that no I'll tell you what they're doing now I'm very excited about what they're doing now they're going to be putting a package together which will give uh, several choices to those Americans traveling to Victoria it will be one of the most exciting marketing programs that one can have and it will include sailing it will include flying it will even include jet foil and the private entrepreneur will have a piece of that action which is really the best place for but that kind Maggie of investment won't be there. everybody's very emotional about the marguerite including myself I think it's Glasgow a nice the same year as me <laughs> what? Is it that yeah. old? I didn't realize that. <laughs> I bet you bring it back. I bet you it's back on that run. Uh, Jack, uh, we made a decision because of safety. Second that look, it would second not look, be. reconditioned, I'll be back on the run. Well, that's not in my hands. I'll be part of a decision making, of course, if, uh, if it comes to Cabinet again. I Questions. doubt if it will. Questions to Grace McCarthy, Minister of Human Resources, after the break. <laughs> Call from Victoria to Grace McCarthy. Go ahead, please. Hello. Good morning, Mr. Webster. Morning, ma'am. Good morning, Mrs. McCarthy. Good morning. I'd like to ask Mrs. McCarthy, what is she going to, what is the government going to do about thousands of old age pensioners who, through no fault of their own, have a little bit more money than those that can apply to gain and safer programs? We have to pay increase on our rents every year up to the amount of 15 to $20 we have to pay for our heat, our parking, and TV. Now, these are things that are increasing every year, and a lot of us will not be able to keep up with it because the little bit of money that we have will have to be drawn into it, and we won't have any chance of being able to meet those, um, uh, m m that money later on. Mm -hmm. You, you raise a very good point. Uh, the government uh, has put in a program called SAFER, which you're familiar with, no doubt, having mentioned it, 
which uh, does assist those people who are in that position to uh, it's, it's save them from having rent increases. But you're above that category, so you have some means. You have some investment or you have uh, uh, some uh, interest coming in, and the government uh, guarantees to a certain level anything that you have beyond that, such as real estate or bonds or whatever that you have, uh, one cannot cover as a government all of those uh, cases. However, when you get to the point where help is needed, the government has a program for you. I appreciate that's not an answer that you want this morning, but uh, any other answer to that would, um, would suggest that the government is able to, um, uh, would be able to f uh, finance people who, who have means. And where do you draw the line? There has to be a cutoff place somewhere, and, that, and that's what we... But I feel a lot of us are in the eight thousand to nine thousand dollar class. Now that is not considered uh, exorbitant means by any anyway, because in this day and age it costs Thank you around three hundred dollars and over for your mm -hmm. rent, plus your phone and your light and mm -hmm. your other utilities. Yeah. So therefore, what are you going to live on? You're in a very difficult position, and those who are constantly uh, falling behind are those who have retired on a certain amount of money, maybe 10 years ago, and inflation has has just zapped their income. But all you can income. do is say, watch the cutoff line and give sympathy. Really. That's that's really. Uh, Thank uh, you, ma'am. Next uh, call, please, mm -hmm. from Victoria. Yes, uh, Mrs. McCarthy. <clears throat> Good morning. Yes, I'm for regards. Uh, I was for a former Socrate member before. And it really hurts me deeply to find out that such a party that I belong to uh, performed dirty tricks and was in the mind such a uh, disgrace to the people of B.C. But what I would like to ask you is um, a question that arose. We hear that uh, uh, MLA members who go on trips are allowed, what, $7 a day or with friends or whatever it is. Is that true or not? Not $7. You can I'm more sorry. Than I, I'm you want to know the expense allowance for MLAs and cabinet ministers and public business? Yes, on their trips. Well, yeah. what, what I've heard is that uh, you have been charging when you go home and that, whereas you, you know, if you know what I mean, you're not supposed to be, an MLA or a cabinet minister is not allowed to be charging when they go home, but on trips uh, to their uh, ridings or whatever. But it, well, it, I've never been charged with that, but, uh, but uh, I think what you're trying to make out is that uh, cabinet ministers traveling to their homes are putting in expenses. Um, I would uh, question that, and I'm going to say this to you, that uh, the government is very careful and the auditors of the government are very careful that cabinet ministers' uh, allowances are very well monitored, that uh, traveling expenses, of course, are paid, and uh, s such things as automobile travel and, uh, and plane travel on the business of the government is taken care of. Thank you, sir. Next call, please. And I don't accept dirty tricks either, Jack. And as a, as a, the statement that he made, I don't accept that uh, dirty trick uh, uh, explanation of the social credit party. A few people, two people to be exact, have uh, made a mistake and, and gave uh, counsel to people to sign letters with other people's names, which we as a party do not condone, and we never have had that as a party policy. I want to make that clear. Sure, but, but along with the Premier and the Marguerite, you'd agree with me it was badly handled when it was exposed. Well, anything that's difficult well, not is not easy again. to handle. No question. Go ahead, next call. Grace? Yes? Yeah, uh, Grace, please. Speak up, then. Good morning. Good morning. I am a small uh, board member of a small community center. Now, we were uh, led to understand by one of the original directors that we could not fund uh, a portion of uh, our uh, community uh, representation by the fact that you have cut off uh, one of your human resources representatives. What are you talking about, sir? You're not making much sense. What board are you talking about? Let's be specific. All right. A small community center, Jack. Where? East Hastings. Where? On East Hastings? East Would it Hastings. be the Hastings Community Center, or is it the Sunrise, or Frog which Hollow. One? I'm sorry? Frog Hollow, yes. Right. And what have you lost? We have lost one representative from the Human Resources Board, which did a wonderful job last year in representing... Um, and you want this person reappointed? Yes. 
Was the appointment made by ourselves or was it an appointment by the board of the Frog Hollow Community Center? I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with this case. Uh, well, if you'll leave your telephone number with Linda, Linda will pass it on to Grace's secretary in Victoria. How about that? Sure. Otherwise, this will take all day. Nick, call, please. Please to look into it. Hello, Grace. Uh, I've been trying to get a hold of you for about uh, six months. It's nice to talk to you. Good morning. My call was in regards to the Family Relations Act. Yes. Uh, it ignores the need for children to have a legal status in law. The children will remain possessions or objects with no rights, okay? A child under five years since of time isn't considered. Uh, I've got two children that are in care. I've been after uh, MHR for a year to try to get them out of care. Uh, the Hutchinson decision uh, has set the uh, court thing back where it takes you six months to get a court date to get you. True. Now, just hold a second because we've only got 40 seconds. The okay. man is right since the F... Family Relations Act business ultra vires. All cases of these are now going to the Supreme Court. Takes months. Can you speed it up? Well, uh, my this is not my legislation. No. Family Relations. It's Attorney General. But could I just add some help here? Our uh, responsibility is the Protection of Children Act. And in terms of the Prote Protection of Children's Act, we are going to be changing it in this session and bringing in family and children's legislation, which I hope will give some assistance to uh, the caller. Yeah, well, we'll do more on that. And I'd like time. to do more and on that. On very of maintenance uh, My uh, thanks to Grace McCarthy. Uh, I'll be back with Linda after the break. What's on tomorrow, Linda? Tomorrow, Brian has a story about a man by the name of Mr. Zanetti who dares to make pasta in cantaloupes. Also, we have Mary Van Stoke, author of a child, child battery book. Oh, dear. Battered babies. What else? What else? Is that about it? That's it for tomorrow. Well, it's been good fun in Victoria. Say hello to Linda quickly, Grace. Hello, Say Linda. Bye. Bye. Tomorrow, 9 a.m., precisely from Vancouver. <laughs>